On December the 11th, 2022, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration completed its latest mission, Artemis 1, when the unmanned, partially reusable Orion spacecraft splashed down in the Pacific Ocean. Capable of carrying up to six human crew members, this Orion capsule for Artemis 1 merely carried mannequins and robots as part of a test to see whether it could endure a record-breaking 1.4 million mile trip around the moon before returning to Earth. It made touchdown 50 years to the day since the crew of NASA's Apollo 17 set foot on the moon. Back then, Eugene Cernan and Harrison Schmidt became the last of only 12 people to tread on the lunar surface. Three more planned missions to the moon, Apollos 18 through 20, were cancelled due to budget cuts and changed priorities in NASA's overall mission, once the US government had decided that it had won the space race with the Soviet Union. Fifty years later, and it's an exciting time for fans of space exploration. NASA's stated aim with Artemis is to put the first woman and person of colour on the moon and build an orbital station around the moon for further exploration of our nearest neighbour and the further reaches of our solar system, but it also includes the construction of a base camp on the surface of the moon. And this isn't the first time the USA has planned to build a lunar base. Back when NASA was just a fledgling organisation which had yet to be given the task of putting a man on the moon, the US military proposed a secret plan to put soldiers on Earth's largest satellite, in something they called Project Horizon. On the 9th of June 1959, the Director of Army Research and Development, Lieutenant General Arthur Trudeau, presented a report to President Dwight D. Eisenhower on Project Horizon. The report was several months in the making, having been signed off by Trudeau in March 1959. The thoroughness of the study and its slick presentation is evident in the very nice cover artwork, like something from a science fiction magazine. Someone had fun making this. The report was put together by the Army Ballistic Missile Agency, with enthusiastic support from Army Chief of Staff Maxwell Taylor. It begins by clearly stating, there are no known technical barriers to the establishment of a manned installation on the moon. What year was this written again? 1959. <sighs> Project Horizon called for immediate action to ensure that the USA could establish a manned military outpost on the moon that was of sufficient size and contained sufficient equipment to permit the survival and moderate constructive activity of a minimum of personnel, about 10 to 20, on a sustained basis. Eventually, the report settles on sending just 12 men to begin with. Like the Twelve Apostles. Who says the military can't have religiously symbolic pretensions? Two men would land on the moon at first, wearing pretty funky suits that aren't far off designs the Apollo astronauts would wear a decade later, apart from the ice skates. These two men would start constructing a permanent base from 490,000 pounds, or 222 tons, of cargo that would have been separately deposited on the lunar surface before they landed. The basic building blocks of the base would be 20 feet long by 10 feet wide cylindrical metal tanks. The first men on the moon would assemble and bury some of these tanks as their living quarters. Over time, the construction crew would be increased to nine men, until the whole base was assembled with a full complement of twelve men. Six of these men would be occupied by the day-to-day -day duties of general maintenance and life support. The base would initially be powered by two nuclear reactors buried underground. This makes a lot of sense, since there's no reason to assume you'd be able to find fuel buried among the moon rocks. And things haven't really changed much. In June 2021, NASA announced three $5 million contracts to develop design concepts for a nuclear fission system to power the Artemis moon base. The concepts are for a 40 kilowatt reactor, a fairly modest size. Back in the 1950s, the USA's purported first nuclear power plant, Chicago Pile 4 in Idaho, was designed to have an output of 200 kilowatts. The Project Horizon report itself mentions the Watertown Arsenal reactor, which could generate 5,000 kilowatts, so it's fair to assume that the Army had aspirations for the ultimate size of their moon base. Still, 5,000 kilowatts doesn't go too far. 
When the report was published, the average US household used over 12,500 kilowatts per person per year. The two proposed nuclear reactors on the moon would only provide 833 kilowatts at best. So, the plans in the report suggest it'd be a cozy but not comfortable life in bunkers for the very first men on the moon. That said, the report lists the facilities the moon base would have. In addition to voice communication between members of the Lunar Party, a number of other electronic devices will be used at the outpost. These include TV receipt and transmission, transmission of still photographs, homing and location devices, instantaneous self-contained emergency communication packs for distress signals to Earth, infrared detectors, and radar detectors. Okay, so not the most exciting list of gear, but at least they'd have TV. They could watch the premiere episode of Lost in Space, right? Then again, maybe not. Communication with Earth would be achieved via a lightweight parabolic antenna near the main quarters. In fact, communications was one of the main goals of Project Horizon, with the base intended as a relay station for a global communications network called LunarCom. This would be a military communications network, obviously. And that would be the ultimate purpose of Project Horizon, to militarize the moon. The report states that the employment of moon-based weapons systems against Earth or space targets may prove to be feasible and desirable. Moon-based military power will be a strong deterrent to war because of the extreme difficulty, from the enemy point of view, of eliminating our ability to retaliate. Suddenly, the report's reference to the nuclear reactor at the Watertown Arsenal makes a lot more sense. After all, the first nuclear reactors in America were built to generate plutonium for nuclear warheads. It also explains why the proposed schedule for Project Horizon was such a rush. Project Horizon envisaged putting men on the moon by April 1965, an ambitious target over four years before NASA eventually did it for real with the Apollo 11 mission, which was delivered according to the schedule set out by President John F. Kennedy in this speech. I therefore ask the Congress, above and beyond the increases I have earlier requested for space activities, to provide the funds which are needed to meet the following national goals. First, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. Project Horizon, on the other hand, saw the imperative for a moon base in stark realpolitik terms. It is considered of the utmost importance that the moon be first occupied by the US so that the US can deny Soviet territorial, commercial, or technological claims. If a permanent base can be established first by the United States, the prestige and psychological advantages to the nation will be invaluable. But there's more to the report's sales pitch. This lunar base is needed to protect the United States' interests on the moon, develop techniques in moon-based surveillance of the Earth and space, in communications relay, and in operations on the surface of the moon. When established, the lunar station would be utilized as a base for exploration of the moon, for further explorations into space, and for military operations if required. Oh, and it adds, the base is also needed to support scientific investigations on the moon. Despite the urgency of the military argument, the report does shyly acknowledge that, Admittedly, the security significance of the moon, per se, in the context of offensive and defensive operations, is a matter for conjecture at this time. From the viewpoint of national security, the primary implications of the feasibility of establishing a lunar outpost is the importance of being first. Nevertheless, the results of failure to first place man on extraterrestrial, naturally occurring real estate will raise grave political questions and at the same time lower United States prestige and influence. It is apparent from past space accomplishments that being second again cannot be tolerated. Here, the report is referring to the humiliation the USA felt during the first years of the space race, when the Soviet Union launched the first satellite, put the first animal into orbit, and launched the first lunar probes. 
The minds behind Project Horizon probably also suspected that the Soviets would be the first to put people into space. They were. And when the Project Horizon study was written, the Soviet Union had declared its intention to put a man on the moon in 1967, hence the deadline of winter 1966 for getting the US moon base up and running. Ultimately, Project Horizon foresaw a rotating crew at this lunar base, similar to tours of duty in any other military area of operations. The report predicts that by the end of 1967, 42 men would have been to the moon. That's way more than the 12 that have actually been. Again, with the number 12. Weird. To achieve this, Project Horizon asked for 101 Saturn I rocket launches and 88 Saturn II rocket launches. All this, of course, would cost money. Project Horizon asked for a budget of $6 billion, or $58 billion today. The report points out that this amounted to barely 2% of the annual defense budget. This is almost certainly an optimistic underestimate. Taking everything into account, NASA achieved just six successful moon landings for $28 billion. That's $300 billion in today's money. And as for those 189 Saturn rocket launches that Project Horizon required? In reality, in total, there were only 32 Saturn rocket launches between 1961 and 1975. Perhaps President Eisenhower anticipated these limitations when he turned down Project Horizon. Yet, given his famous speech about the dangers of the military-industrial complex, I like to think he turned down Project Horizon to ensure that space exploration remained within the remit of NASA, an explicitly civilian agency established by him in 1958 to centralize and oversee the US efforts in space exploration. The report itself says, United States military capabilities in space are necessary to ensure that space will not be used for military purposes against the free world, that man will move into space both for military reasons and for scientific exploration. There are no principles or legal rules which can be said to recognize or create any rights in or duties on the part of states operating beyond the atmosphere in outer space or on the lunar surface. In 1967, the US joined 132 other countries in signing the Outer Space Treaty, which establishes that space is free for all and sovereign claims cannot be made. Project Horizon, however, had other ideas. What is regarded as international law and its presuppositions and prerequisites in the field of outer space activity are nothing more than the wishes or pious thoughts or aspirations or fears of the writers. They cannot bind, control, or even limit states and nations in the new dimension. There appears to be nothing that settled international law requires of the United States with respect to her activities in outer space. The hard or soft landing of men or flags or even a ship bearing a flag would have no effect upon territorial claims to the lunar surface as a matter of law. Nothing short of actual settlement or actual occupation would be cognizable, and only to the extent that a particular surface was in fact held and actually settled. In other words, when it came to colonizing space, the US military saw potential disputes with the Soviets to be governed, unsurprisingly, by the aphorism, might makes right. Actually, Project Horizon seems to have thought of its moon base like a Wild West town. Disputes with other nations would be a matter for settlement, possibly by resorting to violent action, simply because the nations of the world have provided no appropriate courts or tribunals to deal with such matters judicially. I hope you can agree with me that Eisenhower probably did humanity a favour by rejecting Project Horizon. Thanks, Ike. But would it have ever happened even if Eisenhower had signed it off? I'm sceptical, if only because of how much money it required. Horizon's moon base may have been projected to cost $58 billion in today's money, but NASA's Artemis program is expected to cost $28 billion just to put another human on the moon, let alone build a permanent base. 
I can't see any Congress signing off that budget in the 1960s, especially in light of the delicate political climate after the erection of the Berlin Wall, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the lengthy Vietnam War. I bet that if Eisenhower had greenlit Project Horizon, JFK or LBJ would have nixed it. But, of course, today, NASA isn't the only one trying to return to the moon. The Chang'e project is the China National Space Administration's program of unmanned missions to the moon, with the ultimate aim of building a crude scientific research station on the moon's south pole by 2029. Though the Cold War officially ended in 1989, it seems the USA continues its space race with communist superpowers of the East. Don't take my word for it. Take former senator, former space shuttle crew member, and current NASA administrator Bill Nelson's word for it. In an interview published in Politico on January the 1st, 2023, he said, It is a fact. We're in a space race. And it is true that we better watch out that they don't get to a place on the moon under the guise of scientific research. And it is not beyond the realm of possibility that they say, Keep out. We're here. This is our territory. If that sounds strikingly similar to what the Project Horizon report said 64 years ago, it's because it is! Technology may have improved, the goals may be more ambitious, but the motivations that provide the resources behind humanity's journey to the moon remain the same. Is that a good thing? History will reveal the answer. But what do you think? I want to know. Please tell me in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, then please share it with your friends. Give it a like. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. If you are subscribed, then make sure you hit the bell notification icon to keep up to date on all of our latest videos, including the weekly podcast. And a massive thank you to all of our Patreon supporters and YouTube members for keeping this channel going all these years. Here's to another year to come. See you next time.